Uh, it, it, we're cautiously optimistic. Uh, I'll put it to you that way. So we'll see what happens. He's just gotten into office. Uh, I'm sure he's going through the the challenges of taking over um, a division of the DOJ that hasn't had um, permanent leadership in place for quite some time. Um, so it'll take a little time to get uh, settled. But overall, his uh, his middle management folks uh, know what they're doing. Have been around for years, so he's in good hands as far as getting up to speed. That's for sure. All right. All right, so that's all we can do. Let's keep our fingers crossed and hope he uh, plays in our favor. All right, so let's jump right into the legislative aspects of today's presentation. Again, you might, guys might want to take some notes. Uh, we, uh, we did start the recording on this in case you miss any details. Uh, first thing we want to go over is the Safe Communities Act. In case you missed this, it was signed into law in June, and uh, it did receive a lot of media for a couple of days, and then it kind of died, but we want to expand on it as it pertains specifically to this community. Again, it was approved on, uh, approved on June 25th by um, Congress, and it has very, some very specific issues for us to um, understand and mobilize on. First, it dictates that individuals less than 21 years of age will be scrutinized for possible ju juvenile mental health records prohibiting the transfer of a firearm, specifically, Anyone 18, 19, or 20 years old attempting to buy a long gun will, go, will be subject to the mental health review uh, by, by the FBI or your state agencies once all of this is available. And please hold your questions to the end of this topic. What we'll do is um, try, to, try to answer just a couple questions at the end of each of these bills that we're talking about because we're sure you're going to have a lot of questions. Uh, but these mental health records will be... Um, Again, uh, publicly, uh, actually uh, privately available to your background check agency, whether it be FBI next or your state agency, state police, or local jurisdiction. Somehow these uh, mental health wet records will be used to review um, whether or not somehow a determiner in deciding whether or not a transfer can be completed. Uh, any individual subject to this scrutiny will be delayed up to uh, 10 business days if necessary, pending a decision of such records. And again, if you can already assume, this is uh, all to do with uh, mass casualties, mass shootings, uh, a lot of the uh, recent um, young, younger adults, you know, in that 18, 19, 20 year old age group, uh, uh, finding access to AR long guns, AR pistols and firearms and uh, causing mass casualties. So this was a very fast implementation and approval process. Um, Again, uh, moving very, very fast. It also, within this bill, it also extends penalties for straw purchasers, purchasers who are involved in the trafficking of firearms, the trafficking of firearms are pertinent to domestic violence, uh, I'm sorry, domestic terrorism, to drug trafficking, and also uh, if they're found to support any felonious act, meaning if someone buys a gun for someone else who commits a felony, uh, that person can be subject to, to up to 15 to 25 years imprisonment just for facili facilitating the purchase or straw purchase of that firearm. Again, the bill plays out a, a lot of uh, language on this. Uh, how does it affect you? Well, it's going to increase your focus on preventing straw purchases from uh, um, uh, occurring and your straw purchase, uh, straw purchase prevention programs because there will be a lot of scrutiny on those associated with this if it becomes public issues with fel felonies, shootings, drug trafficking, et cetera. Also combined in this bill, um, actually a positive, couple positives, believe it or not. Uh, it will actually permit the FFL uh, voluntary and free use of NICs for current and prospective FFL employee background checks. So forever, the FBI says you can never use NICS to background check an employee who works wants, wants to work for you to make sure they're not prohibited. So after many, many years of hearing that, now they're telling us, oh, by the way, you can do that. So uh, that's a big plus, actually. Um, no more penalties for that. Not an issue we have to talk about anymore. Yet, we don't know when this is actually taking place and or how you can actually start initiating this practice in your place of business. But that's a big plus. 
Uh, for all of you or any of you who have done any background checks on your employees uh, through a bona fide service, you know that uh, any adverse result, meaning an employee who can't be hired because of any derogatory information in the background, more or less prohibiting information, uh, in the past you were required to provide that applicant the information or at least the contact to the background check agency that provided that information uh, deeming them unacceptable to work for you. Well, the nice thing here with this program that will be rolled out again under this bill with, with uh, NICS, uh, this will be exempt from what we call a Fair Credit Reporting Act, where you will not have to explain to the employee why you can't hire them. Uh, basically, they'll handle their turndown of employment very similar to a transfer of a firearm that was denied. They'll be uh, sent to the FBI next agencies to figure out why they weren't capable of being uh, employed by an FFL and why they were being prohibited. So that's, that's a, again, a, a lot going into this program. No details. We just know it's been approved and will come down the pipe very, very shortly. And then lastly, which is also another positive, FFLs may use the NCIC, National Crime Information Center, Again, it's, an, it's, a, it's a supported by the FBI to check on stolen firearms, the status of whether or not a used firearm being presented to you for um, either, either purchase or trade or pawn, uh, whether or not that firearm has been reported lost or stolen. So it will essentially serve as a clearinghouse to monitor for, for uh, used, used uh, stolen firearms. So that's a real plus for the industry. We're very excited about that. Um, again, unfortunately, we don't have any details, but we actually have uh, new processes to look forward to. And then finally, uh, embedded in this law is a provision in the, uh, that, that plays into the 4473 process that you all process right now. Uh, it's in regards to question 21I on the prohibiting questions that relates to or asks about, have you ever been convicted of a misdemeanor crime of domestic violence? Uh, up until now, that has really pertained only to uh, spouses, husband and wife, uh, cohabitants, um, you know, common wed uh, husband and wife. It really hasn't moved beyond that um, criminality to include anyone who has dated someone who has abused or, or, or battered or assaulted someone they were dating in the past. So. This is a whole new area of enforcement, uh, and the FBI has to figure out how they're going to monitor for these types of charges, arrests, crimes, convictions. But now it has to, it, it will go from, to boyfriend and girlfriends uh, being convicted of domestic, abuse, domestic violence or domestic abuse and being convicted of that in the past. They'll be disqualified from uh, purchasing a firearm and we're just assuming there's going to be a lot, of, a lot of boyfriends and girlfriends out there disappointed when they can't buy a gun for something they did, um, you know, after a date or a bad date. <laughs> All right, here's the quagmire here. Uh, and when this was all passed in June of 2022, it was concluded, the bill was concluded with the, with the quote, that all of this was to be implemented no later than 90 days after the date of enactment of this act. Well, that means by, let's see, June, July, August, by September 25th, all of this is supposed to be in play, in process, rolled out, explained, and um, required by different agencies and by the FFL community. All right, we went through a lot of different things here, and this is just the start. Like I said, if you turned off your TV last week, you missed a lot of critical information uh, that we need to get through. All right, uh, JC, you want to? Should we keep going or get grab a question or two before we? Oh uh, no, let's keep going. We'll save the okay. questions. All right. Next, we move into the assault weapon ban. Okay, did you know this got resurrected on Wednesday night at uh, at a, uh, actually Thursday morning, a little past midnight? Well, yes, this is the assault weapon ban. If any of you are old enough to remember the 1994 ban by, uh, under President Bill Clinton, uh, it lasted for 10 years till 2004. Anyway, it was a, a permanent ban. Um, 
on all new imported manufactured sold pawned you name it any a any assault weapon as defined at the time and this has been resurrected uh, this week by the Democrats and the House in Congress. And it came out fast and furious by uh, Jerry Nadler. He was, uh, he's the chair of the Judiciary Committee. And we think this is in, um, basically in preparation for the midterm elections where the Democrats may have no power to do much of anything. And they're trying to get in as many bills and proposals uh, on the docket as possible before the midterm elections, before they lose the power in the House and or, or in the Senate. And this got pushed through very quickly. It's called HR 1808. You can look it up. You can Google it. But again, it was all over the news for about a day, and we just moved on to something else. But this is critical to our business. Uh, this is a resurrection of the complete ban on centerfire semi-automatic rifles or uh, multi, um, uh, modern sporting rifles, MSRs. We commonly call them ARs, okay? AR pistols, AR rifles. So they're looking to ban all of these, uh, manufactured, imported, uh, sold, pawned, etc. And and deep in this language of this assault weapon ban, it actually also includes language that refers to semi-automatic shotguns. And how many of those do we have in the United States over the last two years, imported from Turkey and sold everywhere? Uh, so, w again, we don't have the detailed language on this, but this is actually up for vote as we speak. It could be this week and it could be next week where the vote is taken on this. And quite frankly, we're concerned from an NSSF perspective, from FFL consultants perspective, from an industry overall perspective, we're very concerned that this actually might get passed. Uh, it also includes a high capacity magazine limit of 15 rounds. Again, this would be on, well, we don't even know. We don't know if this is new guns, existing guns uh, in the hands of citizens. We are, uh, we'll have to await the final language on this, this if in fact it goes through the vote and um, comes out in favor of being approved. It also includes language that outlaws um, pistol stabilizing arm braces. We've talked about this for many months already. We've heard many rumblings about the stabilizing arm braces being uh, regulated to a higher degree by the ATF eventually. But now this new law that was introduced um, Thursday morning, early in the morning, includes language to totally um, illegalize stabilizing arm braces. And our one of our um, best supporters out there is Jim Jordan, Senator Jim Jordan, uh, Congressman Jim Jordan from Ohio. And during the hearings, uh, and you can go out and try to find this on uh, YouTube or Google it, uh, but he challenged um, Mr. Nadler, Nadler in this hearing, and he said, so to clarify, Mr. Chairman, you're saying it is the point of the bill to ban weapons that are in common use in the United States today? And Jerry Nadler simply replied, yes. So that is where this side is coming from. This is where the um, Democrats are coming from. And uh, we're very, very concerned about what happens next. All right. Similarly, um, we've had Adam Schiff, another Democrat leader, try to push through uh, to repeal the PLCAA this week. And that was introduced actually on Ju July 21st through HR 2814 proposal. And for all of you who may not totally know what this is, it's the PLCAA, Protection of Lawful Commerce in Arms Act. This has been in existence since 2006. Larry Keene of the uh, General Counsel for the National Shooting Sports Foundation was very um, uh, instrumental in getting this approved back then, along with many supporters in uh, many areas of government and industry. And this basically protects firearm manufacturers, importers, dealers, range operators, and pawnbrokers from being sued by any, any, any victim of a criminal, a criminal act resulting from a firearm that was purchased through them, manufactured by them, imported by them, etc. So uh, this is like saying the, the auto industry, uh, every car dealer, Ford or Chevy or whoever, should be held accountable for the injury that a driver um, uh, causes on someone else as a result of using that vehicle for their personal use. Okay, this again, the PLCAA 
has been emplaced specifically to protect the firearm industry um, members. This has been in conversation year after year after year, but it's never been approved because it's, it's, it sounds ridiculous in, in, in the simplest form. Uh, just like pharmaceutical companies can't be held uh, accountable for the damage that the drugs do to people who use them you know, against directions and without instruction or, or haphazardly or unlawfully. So we are very closely watching this this week as well. Um, we wish we had better news. We don't know which way this is going to go. Again, we don't know how many votes they have uh, uh, between the Republicans and the Democrats actually to get this passed. Very, very concerning. All right, so how can you help? This is very critical. You've probably seen other emails from not only us last week, but the NSSF and other industries, other Second Amendment support organizations, sending this, this information to you. If they had your email, you've, uh, hopefully um, you've received it. But we need you to please voice your opinion to your representative, your congressman, your senators. Uh, you know, it's all about constituents voicing their opinion for the future vote. We need help in the Second Amendment um, uh, expansion of our rights, not um, pr proliferation of it and not denial of our rights. And especially as an industry, we need your help. So please, by phone, you can reach out to your House representative. You can simply uh, use that link here. Uh, look it up on, on the Internet. Go to house.gov, www.house.gov, slash representative, slash find your representative. Simply, that you just plug in your, your zip code and you actually get a list of phone numbers you can call. And I took advantage of the email version. It took me four minutes to complete my email uh, request to my local congressman and my senator to ask for their vote to disapprove and vote against these outrageous uh, restrictions on the firearms industry. Uh, you can simply go to our website, ffllconsultants.com and find the link right at the bottom of the page in big red and white letters, you say, contact your representative here. You just plug in your zip code. It, I'm sorry, it takes you to the NSSF website, uh, the government relations website. You plug in your zip code and you just find your person, you click a box and you enter your name. It's that simple. It takes five minutes, less than five minutes. Please try to complete that today or tomorrow. We need, need this done as soon as possible because these votes, again, can occur this week or next week and impact us all. All right. All right, JC. All right. Give you a little bit of a break there. Maybe we're going to talk about 2021 R-05F. This is the latest and greatest ATF ruling out there. We're in the final countdown stages. So next slide. Very good. All right, so we are in that 30-day downtown, effective 824.22. Um, essentially, the definition of a firearm frame and receiver will change. And this is primarily uh, due to the fact of technology advances in technology and such. Um, we'll also be talking about privately made firearms or, uh, you know, the ghost guns. Uh, some marking requirements as it relates to both PMS as well as uh, remanufacturing or manufacturing of firearms. Uh, there will be some changes to record keeping requirements and record retention. So we'll go over these. So first and foremost, definition of frame or receiver. Um, this ruling actually changed, like I said, due to some of the technical changes. Um, and it primarily is because of the advances uh, in privately made firearms. So it's going to go down the path of depending on how that privately made firearm is uh, manufactured or how that it, uh, comes in a kit, uh, what it comes with, etc. So we'll go into it a little bit more detail. Next slide. So example one, a frame or receiver parts kit containing a partially complete or disassembled billet or blank of a frame or receiver that is sold, distributed, or possessed with a compatible jig or template is going to be considered a frame or receiver. So if you have these in your inventory, you are going to be required to mark those before they get sold. So just be aware of that. Um, if there are any online instructions, um, any common hand tools uh, that are sold with it, that will also uh, constitute that as a frame or receiver. Next slide. So this is a great example right here. Here's your blank or your billet, and there is the jig along with uh, some drill bits. If those are sold together, then guess what? 
that is going to be considered a, a receiver in this case. And you are going to have to mark that. And we'll get into the marking requirements here in a minute. Next slide. This obviously is a Glock lookalike. Um, this, as it's sold in the image, if this comes with all those pieces, parts, components, then this is going to be considered a firearm, a frame. Uh, and you are going to have to have that marked before you sell it. And, you know, in years past, the issues have been that, you know, if you're if you're just selling a broken down AR or a broken down pistol, it wasn't considered a firearm because it wasn't put together or wasn't capable of being put together. Well, that has all changed now. So if you have any of these in your inventory, you are going to be required to mark those prior to sale. Next slide. This is not a receiver because it's sold as a standalone blank piece of metal. So if you're getting something like a frame or a receiver in this state, it does not have to be marked. Now, what does that mean? That means it doesn't have a jig. It doesn't have instructions. It doesn't have any hand tools. It doesn't have anything that would help the customer facilitate the completion of that blank. So that's what you got to look at. So if it's just a solid piece of metal and there's nothing there, uh, nothing bored out, cut out, drilled out, then you're good to go. All right. PMS Ghost Guns, privately made firearms. Privately made firearms are going to be required to be marked. The final rule amends the regulations to all, require all FFLs, whether a manufacturer, gunsmith, just a dealer in firearms, any P, mark any PMF they take into inventory. Now, here's the, a couple caveats. Number one, if you just take it in to do something real quick to it and hand it back to the customer, you don't have to mark it. The key is, is whether or not it's going to remain with you over a, a period of time, overnight or longer. So keep that in mind. Now, here's my personal feelings. I don't care about PMS. If you want to make your own firearm, go for it. Uh, there is a lot of confusion about this whole ruling and what is a gun, what's not a gun, who's required to market. Bottom line is uh, we get a ton of phone calls from FFLs. Do I take it into inventory? Should I buy it? Um, what's its value if I pawn this? I know there's some pawnbrokers on today. What part of privately made firearm don't you understand? And, and I want you to understand the liability and risk. You don't know who manufactured it. You have no way of testing it, nor would I. You know, I, I wouldn't want to take on that liability. And privately made firearms do not have a substantial organization manufacturer standing behind them with some sort of warranty or some, some way to address defects in the product. My personal opinion is stay away from them. There's a reason why they're called privately made firearms. Let the person that manufactured it deal with it. But if you do, if you do take possession of it, just know that you are going to be required to mark it with a serial number. And that serial number must include what's called your RDS key. That is the first three and last five of your FFL number. That will be followed by a hyphen and then a unique serial number. So you're going to have to create a unique serial number and record this in your a and records. Now, my recommendation is start off with something like 0001, something of that nature, so you can keep track of how many times you've had to inter interact and engage with a privately made firearm. Um, keep in mind also, you will not have the ability to uh, duplicate any serial numbers. So you want to pay attention to what serial numbers you're issuing out there. When you take it into your a and records, you're going to take it in as a privately made firearm from whoever you're acquiring that firearm for, whether it be for uh, gunsmithing purposes or for purchase. I really have no idea why you would purchase one of these, but hey, uh, the stranger things have happened. Um, one thing to keep in mind, we're getting a ton of questions from FFLs where customers are coming in and, and are very intent on having their privately made firearm serialized. There is no requirement for a non-licensee, somebody that's to, just a John Doe on the street to mark a privately made firearm. There's a lot of confusion over this. There is no responsibility on the part of the uh, individual in possession of the privately made firearm to mark it. It's only if and when it comes in the possession of an, a federal firearms licensee is it to, required to be marked. So just keep that in mind. The final rule, and the training aids are now available out there. Uh, the sessions, if you missed them, I know that uh, they were overwhelmed with a number of uh, 
personnel that were or people that were allowed to attend those sessions. Uh, I think uh, after a while you got locked out of that room. But the video is available out there on YouTube, I believe, JB. Yep, yep. Yep. The video is out there. It's about an hour and 45 minutes long. Uh, Mariana Mitchum is uh, the chief of FIPB with the ATF. She is kind of uh, uh, mon moderating that session. Uh, it's a decent session. Just keep in mind, it's an hour and 45 minutes long. So you want to might want to take it in blocks. So um, yeah, just, just go to YouTube and search plug in ATF final rule 2021-05F into the search box and you should find it easily. Beautiful. So just keep that in mind. And, and again, I, I reemphasize there's no requirement for non-licensees to mark their firearms. You may see some customers coming in and wanting to, to mark the firearm so they don't get in trouble. They're not going to. If they don't want to take your word for it, by all means, you can mark it. Those are the marking requirements. So markings can no longer be placed on the barrel or pistol slide if applicable. So a big change here, and, and we all saw it, especially with those Turkish shotguns that were coming in during the pandemic. They were putting markings everywhere and anywhere. And we basically, in some instances, had to break down the entire firearm just to find the markings. Well, all that comes to an end as of August 24th. They're all going to be required to be marked on whatever the actual firearm is, i.e. the frame receiver. So keep in mind, this is going to take some time to get into place. It'll take some time for you to see this. But come August 24th, really, most of the manufacturers should already be doing this anyway, since they knew it was coming. So it's going, it's just going to be a lot easier for us and for you as FFLs to identify the firearm markings, et cetera, so you can document them accordingly. I know that there's been many a shotguns where it literally had to take the whole thing apart just to find information about the firearm. So this is kind of a win for us, so to speak. It just helps us better define things uh, in our A&D records. All right. J JC, how about if I have multiple uh, manufacturers and multiple serial numbers in the future? Sure. I thought that was the next slide, but I can certainly talk to that. So oh, oh. If, oh, you might be right. There you go. Yeah. All right. So number one, list all serial numbers manufacturers properly. So here, here's on remanufactured firearms. A uh, great example is you, you, you're a manufacturer. You have a customer come in. They have a, a Palmetto State Armory lower, and you're going to build them out a full MSR platform rifle. So what you're going to be required to do is either adopt that existing serial number, or if it's a, a repeat or you've used that serial number before, you'll have to add a serial number. Um, you'll add your manufacturer information to that. And the way you record this going forward in your A&D records, whether you receive a fully complete MSR or a fully complete a uh, uh, pistol, whatever the case may be, you're going to requ be required to document both manufacturers. So the way to do that is real simple. Whoever the original manufacturer is, document that slash whatever the new manufacturer is. If it's you, great, put your FFL name there. Serial numbers, same thing. If there are two serial numbers on a firearm, that's fine. Just go ahead and document the first serial number slash document the new serial number whether it's new or it's a secondary serial number, whatever the case may be, all right? Um, so that's something we were seeing a lot of lately. Um, I don't know why all of a sudden it's popping up uh, more frequently, but it seems to be on our inspections. So just keep that in mind. You need to document all of the information. Remember, it's all about the trace. Uh, and you're, you're as an FFL, you're responsible to make sure all that documentation is there. So that way, if and when that firearm does show up in a crime, they know exactly where that firearm came from and, and basically the life cycle of that firearm. All right. All right. FFLs must retain. This is the record keeping pace. Uh, FFLs must retain firearm transaction records as well as A&D records until the discontinuation of business or license activity. As the law and regulation exists today, if you have been in business for 20 years, come 20 years and plus one day, you are able to either A, send those, those business records into the uh, National Tracing Center, or you are able to destroy those records. Well, now, as of August 24th, basically, you are required to keep all of your records until the discontinuation of your business or licensed activity. That means forever and ever until death do you part, you need to keep your records. Um, just so you're aware, 
rule does allow for paper records older than 20 years to be stored off-site. Previously, you were able to seek a variance for this. In 2019, they shut that down. So now you are going to be required to keep everything up to 20 years on site, and then everything 20 years plus one day can be moved off-site or maintained electronically. So if you've been in business for that long, um, definitely reach out to us. We can help you with that process and make sure you're good to go. Um, just so everybody's aware, the national average for time to crime is almost eight years. So that's the reason why they want these records maintained, because they are seeing um, firearms being recovered. Um, we have FFLs that have firearm records all the way back 40 years, and uh, they still get trace requests on those. So, um, you know, the ATF wants to know where they're at. All right, the Nixon Denial Notification Act, October of 2022, this goes into effect. This is going to be an interesting one, um, and this one kind of slipped through the cracks. Nobody really has put any press out about it. Nobody has talked about it, really, um, but something certainly to be uh, knowledgeable of and deal with uh, when you get into a denial situation. What does the NICS Denial Notification Act require? It requires federal authorities, that's NICS, um, to alert state and local law enforcement if somebody is denied for a firearms transaction. So that means that FFLs, you're probably going to get approached by lo local law enforcement or state law enforcement and asked about a specific transaction. I, as being a former law enforcement officer, I can tell you, I have no idea how local authorities are going to deal with this because this is going to just up their caseload considerably. So God only knows what they're going to do with this, but just be aware, you may actually see uh, local law enforcement or state level law enforcement coming into your shop asking you about a denied transaction. Um, there really aren't any more details available than that. We don't know, you know, really how this is going to work out. So we're just as interested as everybody else. Um, just keep in mind that you want to make sure with any denied transactions, a couple different things. Number one, don't just set the form aside and say, oh, well, they were denied. I didn't transfer firearm. I'm good to go. No, make sure you complete that form through box 35. That's key. Make sure that everything on that form is, is uh, filled out and completed accurately and completely. All right. That's number one. Make sure you're filing them. Make sure you're maintaining them on record for fi the five-year period as required. All right. You want to make sure that's happening. The other thing I want you to make sure you're doing, and we, we see this a lot of FFLs, and I'm not really sure why. We've had a number of FFLs that weren't even aware of this. Have the customer that was denied go through the appeal process, or at least offer them the knowledge that there is an appeal process. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but 26% of appeals that actually are processed are actually overturned. 26%. And I know full well that there are a plethora of FFLs out there that don't offer that um, ability to go appeal. They don't educate their customer to say you can appeal. They just hey, you were denied, sorry, and, and the customer walks out the door. No, give them that card and tell them, go ahead and fill out the appeal. You never know, it could be overturned. Um, it's, you know, there are any number of reasons why somebody is denied. So you want to make sure that they have the ability to go through that uh, appeal process. Yeah. Next slide. And JC, yeah. also, we're, we're seeing guys on uh, inspections now, the ATF is looking at your denials like never before. I mean, they we have folks getting cited for not completing, not signing boxes 34 and 35, uh, or, or not getting a customer signature, or not completing uh, box 27D for you know, what happened after the delay. Uh, so this is, this is becoming a part, uh, a main, mainstream audit uh, uh, piece. So don't think that denial folder is not as important as your completed transfers for the, for the, for the reason of this new law going into effect, and they need these documents completed for evidence to go arrest people who were denied, maybe they were told never to buy a gun or attempt to buy a gun. These, these are federal documents. They have to be completed in their entirety as required. So don't get caught up in that. Okay. Yeah. I'll grab All this right. one, Jason. You want this one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll take this one. Okay, ATF yeah. ruling 2021 R-08. The arm braces. Still pending. Stop asking us questions about this because we don't know. And the ATF doesn't even know yet. Um, a few things have even changed. Um, you know, there, there's a number of facets to this, but essentially just be paying attention. Um, depending on the characteristics of the firearm, along with the arm brace, 
will make the determination whether it's considered an SBR or still considered uh, an MSR pistol or handgun. Who who really knows? You know, they've already removed the factoring criteria worksheet allegedly from this process. So this is going to be a very interesting transition. We'll see where it goes. Um, who knows? <laughs> Honestly, who knows? So. Um, Manufacturers that received classifications previously can resubmit for evaluation. Um, obviously, if you have one that falls into the SBR scenario, you can surrender it, turn the firearm in with the attached stable, stabilizing brace into the ATF. I seriously doubt anybody's going to do that. You can convert the firearm into a long barreled rifle or, or potentially you can convert the, bear, the firearm back into a true AR pistol. Um, so it meets the criteria, whatever the case may be. Or you can just remove the arm brace, or you can just buy a, a legitimate arm brace that isn't you know, factored into this thing. And then the other is you can definitely register it via Form 1 uh, as an NFA firearm and make it an SBR and keep it that way. So um, those are your options. And I certainly see either you go ahead and you submit a Form 1, make it an SBR, or two, remove and destroy the stabilizing brace that's on there. Yeah, and again, based on what we, you know, we're just hearing in the last uh, week or two, uh, stabilizing braces might be outlawed altogether. So again, stay close to your news channels on this one. All right, uh, hey, all right. this is all. Yeah, you know, we've been dealing with all of these other issues, and um, you know, you think state firearm laws um, were second nature to us, but there's been so much going on that we have not been able to stay up on everything. We just want to let you guys know. Keep calling us. A lot of you call us for. Uh, you know, long gun, out-of-state long gun purchases, folks from, uh, you know, t touring in your area, traveling, hunting in your area. Here's what we're going to say is there's so much happening. It's really, um, it's really a chore <laughs> and uh, for the two of us to stay up on all of these, but we're trying. Um, here's a couple that just recently passed. California, um, it doesn't affect the FFL. So, well, it does affect FFLs in California if you're advertising to minors, if you're marketing to minors, it's now a felony to market firearms to minors in social media or otherwise. So hopefully you don't do that and, and be careful of the channels you do use for your advertising in California. Uh, Rhode Island, they, they now have a 10 round magazine limit that went into effect last month. Same thing with Washington State, July 1st, 10 round magazine limits. Don't get sold, don't get caught selling the uh, 12 or 15 or 17 or 19 rounds or 30 round magazines. Uh, New York State is uh, running fast with a very severe cost prohibitive security uh, requirement program for FFLs that kicks in in December. Uh, yes, we, we are trying to figure out how to prepare and educate the New York State FFL group on that. There's just so many different pieces to it that is taking time for us to get there. But please uh, do your research, um, you know, find out your local town, municipalities, cities. They also have restrictions. Uh, don't get caught selling uh, and F don't don't ship an FFL transfer to another FFL in a state where the restrictions might be like New Jersey or Massachusetts or Illinois or some of those more common states where you know there are restrictions. Call ahead and find out from the FFL if it's permissible to send a firearm that your customer has purchased online to the FFL in that state. Or have a program in place for including restocking fees and uh, different things. Um, we're getting a lot of calls lately, just a lot of calls on uh, folks in restrictive states calling states that are permissive, like like Texas and and uh, Arizona, and asking for FFL transfers or buying online, and lo and behold, those guns aren't permitted in the states where they're being shipped to. We always thought California was the bad state or the hardest state to um, ship to. We ha we have a, we have actually can count them on both hands now. How many states have restrictions that you need to be wary of? So again, call the FFL ahead of time in the other state. See if it's permissible. See if they'll handle your transfer. Otherwise, don't waste your time and, um, and be wary of that. And again, you know, it'll come back to you for not knowing the laws in the states to where you're shipping firearms. So use caution. All right, we're going to move on. Okay, that's all the legislative update. We told you there was a lot. Um, John, you want to run through this fast? All right, so who's most at risk uh, for any type of uh, inspection, reinspection? Uh, if you haven't been inspected in a while and you're kind of scratching your head saying, when is the ATF going to show up? Here, here's some factors you need to take into consideration, all right? So number one, uh, anybody with a warning letter, warning conference, adverse action against your FFL, 
you are susceptible to a reinspection at the 12 month mark. Generally speaking, we say 12 to 18 months, but the fact of the matter is, is uh, at that 12 month mark, they can come back in and look at your records for the last 12 months. New FFLs, I don't know that we have too many of these left, but if you are a new FFL and you did not receive an in-person qualifying inspection, that's your initial interview and inspection by the ATF, you are susceptible to a inspection at the 12 month mark. Um, they're required by regulation to do that, uh, to get out and actually sit down, spend the time with you and see and make sure that you're doing everything uh, possible to conduct lawful commerce and firearms. The, uh, if you're getting a lot of trace requests uh, or denied transactions, uh, you could be susceptible to an inspection. Uh, what's a lot of trace requests? Well, it depends on how many firearms you're transacting. So they, they are definitely putting those to the top of the list. The number of firearms that you've sold that have been recovered associated with firearm related crimes. So if you're seeing a lot of trace requests for firearms that were used in crimes, that could make you susceptible. I said number of overall deny transactions. If you're seeing a high volume of deny transaction, that means you're a target. That means you as an FFL have somehow uh, identified to the criminal element that, hey, I'm going to try to get guns from this customer, from this FFL. Um, so just be aware, if you get a lot of deny transactions, you need to be paying attention. Uh, FFLs with reported theft losses. It used to be that when an FFL experienced a burglary or robbery situation, the ATF would come out and support you. It would not in instigate an inspection. Well, now it is. So they're not only going to come out and support you with, uh, you know, doing a firearms inventory and completing all of the necessary firearms paperwork related to theft losses, but they're also going to go ahead and initiate an inspection. We've seen that a number of times now. And then lastly, info developed from local law enforcement. So if local law enforcement you know, if, if you're in a criminal area, high crime area, um, local law enforcement may be talking to the ATF. Um, we know this up in like Baltimore, Chicago, places like that where there's high crime going on, especially involving firearms. The FFLs in those areas are susceptible to inspection. So you need to be paying attention. Last but not least, when was your last inspection? All right. So keep that in mind. Last but not least, when was your last inspection? If your last inspection it was three to five years ago, chances are you're probably bubbling up to the surface to be reinspected. All right. If you've never had an inspection and you've been open for three to five years, seven years, 10 years, never experienced an inspection, chances are you're floating up to the top of that level there. So just keep that in mind. Um, if you want more information on what to expect through an inspection, definitely reach out to us. We can help you with that. Okay. Quickly, I just uh, update everyone on the numbers. Uh, we bring you this information every month. So through the end of June, uh, the ATF completed 40, almost 4,700 inspections. For all of 2020, they did 5,800 inspections. So we're guessing this year is going to be in the 10 to 12,000 inspection range based on resources they have available and the, and the rate they're moving at. There's the cities with the most inspections and obviously the city, according to our records, with the most revocations and warning conferences and um, calls we get and support we're providing right now. But it is across the board. I mean, this, but this, the redundancy, you know, the issues are here. The frequency is here in these cities. So if you're in these cities, please pay attention, get ready. Chances are the ATF is going to be showing up at your place very soon. Uh, warning conferences year to date, there's 97 issued uh, and finalized. Now, the big issue is finalized. Uh, that means you've gone through the inspection process, you've gone through the uh, review process, you've gone through the hearing process, and in the end, They've said, okay, you, we are issuing you uh, either a warning letter or formal warning conference, and uh, here's your report of violations, and you know, one more, you have one chance left to survive. One more inspection, don't get it wrong the next time. And then on revocations, year to date, uh, we've had 79 finalized. Uh, in 2020, it was only 40 completed for the entire year. And again, these are finalized. This doesn't mean, um, you know, this is, we all heard about the five, 600, 700 letters or, or notice of revocations that have been issued. All of those, and I, we can attest to this, we're dealing with more than 79 in regards to who are still in the process, who has gone through inspection, who has gone through the appeal, who has gone through the delay, who has gone through an informal hearing. Um, you know, and, and the completion process doesn't happen in 30 days. It's usually three, four, five, even five months, depending on how you play it. 
you know, if you have a lawyer involved, if you have evidence to support uh, a rebuttal or evidence, um, you know, to counter counter charge the the accusations and the offenses, it's a mess. It's a long process. It doesn't happen in 30 days. Um, but we expect these numbers, as they are more finalized, obviously month by month, to um, show up more here and uh, get closer to uh, reality because these numbers are not being reported according to the activities are actually involved in. But uh, those are the areas. I mean, this, these are the areas that the activity is occurring. And if your city is you know, listed on any of these um, charts, please you know, make sure your program, your training programs, review processes are in place. We've updated the Biden's five deadly sins, as they were more commonly known, um, for the first few months that the Zero Tolerance Program was launched. Uh, you know, the first five are the same, transferring a firearm to a prohibited person. These are the items that will get your license revoked with, you know, as little as one viol confirmed violation. Uh, second, failing to properly complete a required background check. We gave a lot of examples in that. Falsify, falsifying any federally regulated document or record, meaning your, your forms or your, rec or your bound book or uh, anything you have to submit as a part of your transfer process. Uh, four, not responding to an ATF trace. Five, refusing ATF access. But here's six, having a repeat violation from a prior ATF inspection. JC mentioned that. You are not allowed to repeat a violation from a prior inspection report. So make sure you're looking at your prior reports of violations if you had any, or any disciplinary action that, they, that you were left with, any documentation you were left with on a prior ATF inspection, and make sure you are not repeating any of those items. That's the first thing they look at when they arrive, is can we find these repeats? That's the easiest way for them to revoke your license, aside from you know, not doing a background check or having a prohibited person. This is in the top three. And then failing to submit required reports. How many reports do you have? You have 3310.4s. You have 3310.12s if you're in the southern border states to Mexico. Um, you have bound books. I'm sorry. You have um, uh, tra uh, demand letters, you know, if you're on the quarterly demand two program. So there may be other reports or state re required reports you have to submit. Make sure those are all being submitted in a timely fashion. All right. If you are inspected, please, please, please don't wait. Again, we're supported by the Firearms Trade Association and a lot of what we do. We also uh, you know, offer our free service. Your first call is always free. If you get inspected, just call us. You know, don't worry about the, you know, the, first, the first question should never be how much do you guys cost. The first question should be can you help me? And, and we, do, we do this all day long. Um, it's, it's, we've been doing it for 10 years you know, in this capacity and prior to that in big box firearms retail locations. So uh, we want to help you get through this process to stay compliant and stay in business. Uh, listen to the inspection. Uh, listen to the IOIs who are doing your inspection. Listen, listen to what they're talking about. What, what areas are they focused on? What can you get ahead of? And when it comes to the closing conference, get us to sit in on you. We, last week, I was on three. I sat in on three different closing conferences via phone just to make sure the ATF didn't, um, I guess, document and present facts that were not legitimate to the FFL. And actually, we actually raised a lot of questions on some of the issues and asked for evidence and asked for continuation. We just didn't sign off on the inspection results saying, thank you, uh, can't wait to find out what's next. You don't wanna do that. You wanna get us involved. We can sit in remotely. It's usually an hour to a 90 minute conversation, depending on how many violations there are, and listen to what the ATF decided you did right on what you did wrong. Make a partner and, um, and get us involved. Uh, and then make sure you take the opportunity to provide responses to the violations before you sign that acknowledgement of your visit inspection. And many times, like I said, we delay those. We say we'd like to submit evidence in writing contrary to your findings. And this could, we could take weeks or, or even a you know, month, maybe more longer to present those findings and evidence for reconsideration at the conclusion of the inspection. This is the strategy, guys. Don't think it's, 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 it is structured. It's very, uh, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. There's a structure to it, but just don't take it sitting down. Don't sign off on your inspections unless you are 100% agreeable to everything they're saying and there's actually absolutely no excuse uh, for why some of those violations were documented. Okay. 
All right, your priorities, if you fall into the adverse actions, we talked about this, you know, figure out what caused your adverse action. Take a look at those reports of violations from years past, any inspection results uh, or reports from years past. Make sure you are not having any of those repeats and your staff is fully trained on how to prevent repeats from occurring. Aside from all of the other requirements and all of the other seven deadly sins we just talked about. Um, and, and more importantly, um, you, we see this all the time, don't run your next check prior to the completion of sections A and B on your, on your 4473. Uh, we see this all the time. Um, just to expedite a transfer, we see FFLs or the staff members take the ID, they tell the customer to start filling out the form, and they call in a background check based on the ID. Do not do that. We are hearing about ATF stings around the country. We can't attest to this, but we have gun dealers and, and, and pawnbrokers calling us saying, I think I just had an ATF shop or a secret shop or a sting or they tried to get me to sell uh, or, or commit a pawn purchase, uh, a straw purchase. or they tried to get me to uh, sell a firearm with an expired ID. There's all types of little things, weird things happening around the country. Again, we don't know if these are truly ATF stings or um, secret shops, uh, but be aware that it can be happening if you do have it happening, give us a call. You know, it, we, we usually monitor this by region of the country because we do hear about it in a couple specific areas more often than others. But um, be wary of that. It wouldn't be um, inopportune for them to come in and try to get you to do something wrong based on the requirements of the um, Gun Control Act. And uh, so go ahead and, and again, complete the 4473 by the numbers, Section A, Section B, Section C, then D and E. Don't go, don't, don't skip around and don't try to expedite it for the sake of time. And then here, here's a zero tolerance and revocation scenarios um, that we've been talking about forever. It's accepting expired IDs or CCWs. It's it also meaning listing a date of birth as an expiration date in error. I had three of these last week, unfortunately. Thankfully, I was looking at the paperwork and not the ATF IOI. Uh, transferee uh, self-identifies as a prohibited person. Obviously, you don't want to do that. Make sure you're reviewing the form. Uh, even if you're using electronic um, software to do your 4473 processing, review the form. Don't assume the software is going to be right every time because it's not. We have documented issues and we do contact those software providers when we find them that the software, software goofed, didn't do its job. Uh, it, it left a lot of blocks, uh, maybe 21A, uh, be left blank by mistake, and it wasn't the gunsmithing scenario. Uh, anyway, there's all types of issues. Make sure no matter what system you have, you have a double, triple check process in place before you fi finalize that firearms transfer. Uh, if somebody leaves blocks, when any block in 21, one of those prohibited questions, if they leave it blank, it's as good as incomplete. Leaving a box, 21 item, incomplete, whether it be the felony question or the discharge question or the marijuana question, leaving a blank, constitutes an invalid, incomplete background check. You can re be revoked on one of those issues occurring. Uh, transferring before the Brady deed has uh, passed, meaning less than three days or less than five or 10 days, depending on your state, or after 30 days, if you transfer on the 30, 31st, second, 34th day, we have those issues where people are getting revoked because the salespeople didn't pull out a calendar and figure out 30 days from the certification date. It's not 30 days from the next submittal date, it's 30 days from the customer certification date. Um, accepting out-of-state CCW if you have a NICS exemption in your state. Uh, failing to get recertification in boxes 22 and 23. Failing to reply to traces the same day we talked about this. And straw purchase scenarios. All of these issues, these are the critical issues that will and are getting folks revoked right now. So prepare yourself. Be, don't be an absentee no owner. Remember, do multiple, multiple, multiple reviews of your 4473 before you transfer the firearm. You know, it's so hard to fix it after, fix that transfer document after you transfer the firearm and after that customer leaves with the firearm. If you identify a violation, don't wait to act. Act immediately. Again, you can call us. JCRI will always answer the phone. Uh, one of us is typically on call to take your call, get you through the issue, and get your item corrected. Take, take frequent inventories. Uh, once a year is probably not good enough. At least twice a year. If you can do quarterly inventories or figure out a way to count your gun counts on a monthly basis, 
you know, go ahead and do so. You want to make sure you know your inventory is accurate before the ATF shows up, not only in count, but in serial numbers as well. Uh, conduct periodic reviews of your records and reports. We've talked a lot about this. Implement training, 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 training. You can never give your staff enough training. Straw purchase prevention, 4473, and more importantly, 3310.4s. This is where we find most of our issues is on the transfer documentation process. Uh, and then respond same day to your trace requests. GC? Yeah, all right. So we want you, to, this is something new that we've come out with in the last few months for our FFLs that we support. We want you to create what's called an ATF communications log, all right? And this is all of your communications with the ATF. You receive a trace request, document it, keep records of it. Make sure that you're keeping a file of responding to that because we have had multiple instances where a trace request, they claim it wasn't responded to and the FFL hasn't had proof that they did even though they did. So you wanna make sure you're logging that information. Straw purchase attempts, keep it logged. You know, go get yourself like a little bound uh, a binder or get a, um, a spiral notebook from you know Walmart or whatnot and a multi-subject one so you can break all these things down. So you wanna keep record of store, straw purchase attempts. Denials, keep record of any denials, the, the counts, the quantities of denials. So you know what's going on, especially if, if you have managers and other staff that are involved in this stuff, you wanna be able to fall back onto that uh, ATF communications log and maybe review it every morning when you come in or whatever the case may be and be diligent about it. Make sure you're ke keeping records of how often you're, you're conducting inventories and, and what the results of those inventories were, and as well as miscellaneous incidents. You want to make sure that you're keeping record of all of this information, as well as any communications with ATF directly, and document it. Document it and put down exactly what you asked, what the response was, whether it was via email or phone call, whether they refused to put it in email, whatever the case may be. Just make sure that you're <clears throat> um, keeping accurate records of all of this different stuff, and be sure that you can fall back on that in the event something goes on, in the event that you know you see adverse action, you see a warning conference, you see a warning letter, or worst case, you get a notice of revocation. You want to keep record of all of this. The other thing I want you to keep record of, attending these sessions. This constitutes training. It shows that you are proactive in your training. So you want to keep records, attended training, entire staff attended FFL consultant webinar, whatever the case may be, document it. If you go to an ATF training seminar or a NICS training seminar, document it. That can all be very useful with us if you bring us in to do a compliance action plan or you bring us in to basically represent you during a revocation or a warning conference because we're gonna use all that information to show that you are willing to conduct lawful commerce in firearms and do all you can to ensure that your business is operating properly. Yep, great. Uh, just one or two more slides here, folks. Hey, um, go out, if you haven't already, go out to our website, FFL Consultants. We've got the three-page training guide there, Biden Zero Tolerance Program, How to Avoid a Revocation. It's been out there for months. We have about, um, we have a, <laughs> We have about 2,200 people on, that registered for this event, and we've only had about three or 400, I think I last count, of downloads of this document. I don't know why 2,000 folks that have heard about it haven't downloaded it. We update this as we go with the best practices, the, trips, the tips and tricks to get your staff through the next inspection and stay compliant and, and, and not be accused of zero tolerance. So go out there and just, it's right at the bottom of our website, just go uh, download it. It's three pages. Uh, it's all for you. And then for those of you, I mean, we get these emails and calls all the time. Here it is. If you want us to come out, help you, do a mock audit, uh, support you, uh, be on call for you, everything, everything, everything. Uh, there's the list of things. Uh, it's a, the, the best deal in town. If you want to know more information about this program, uh, just give us a call. JC or I can explain exactly what it is. And the biggest issue here is the $25,000 of legal defense fund protection that's available to you that covers all your attorney fees, our fees, any fees um, attached to your adver adverse action incident with the ATF. If you get inspected, if you go into warning, if you get revoked, 
what you know otherwise we know that the price is you know fifteen to twenty thousand dollars anyway and that would be out of pocket to try to save your business again we just let you know this is out there people keep asking us about it but we'll keep we'll keep talking about it and JC I think we are out of time and ready for questions awesome so we're going to run through questions here and then if you have a question you just want to ask on video i'll open that up here in just a second so uh let me run through them real quick uh will the don't lie for the other guy materials be updated to reflect the up to 15 25 years the answer to that question is yes uh stay posted if you are not a member of nssf or you not have not signed up for notifications from the nssf just head out to nssf.org. They're the ones that actually run the Don't Lie program um, for both the industry and ATF. Uh, and they'll get those um, kits updated with the new information once it goes into effect and offer those up. All right. Uh, let's see. In your opinion, will the West Virginia v EPA provide a basis for overturning 2021R? I have yet, I, this has been brought up several times. I have yet to see anybody going down this path. Um, you know, we're staying tuned uh, on anything. I mean, we're expecting injunctions. Don't know why they haven't happened yet. Uh, I know there are a number of lawsuits out there. So yeah, we'll, we'll stay tuned and let you know as soon as we know more. Uh, I know that's been brought up a number of times. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, let's see, does 21... R-055 apply to older frames or receivers manufactured prior to the serial numbers being required? Negative. Uh, those are all grandfathered in. It's only firearms manufactured from the date that the law is implemented, the regulation is implemented. So um, no, you are not going to have to go back and do anything with old firearms or older firearms that predate the ruling. Uh, is an AR casting considered a firearm if the magwell has been broached and anodized it really uh, chances are probably not but i would have to see images of it to tell you whether or not it would be constituted as a, a receiver so uh if you'd like definitely info at fflconsultants.com send us over some pictures and we can take a look at it without seeing it i can only give you a possibly uh so uh if you send me over the pictures i can give you a more definitive answer yeah. let me do two jc um yeah, if anyone's having problems with that site or the email contact list for the congressman, just send me uh, a note directly at jb at fflconsultants.com and I'll make sure it's, it was working this morning, so we tested it. But send me a note directly and I'll, I'll help you through that or get you through that. Um, JC, here's one from Brad who sent in a note. He says, I am in Illinois. I'll be you know, subject to this ghost gun, serialization, etc. If I'm just a type 1 FFL, will that turn me into a manufacturer if I start applying serial numbers no the ruling the, there's a provision in the ruling to allow any ffl to um mark a firearm not just manufacturers so no that does not make you a manufacturer at all okay. if all you're doing is marking the firearm no that, it's considered a gunsmithing uh, i'll read this one to you jc the example shown on the lower receivers did not cover what the classification would be if there is a stock or brace attached to the lower receiver can you clarify how we would record the classification in our bound book if it had either of those on it if a stock or brace is all that's connected to the receiver it's still just a receiver in other words it's it's not put together in such a way that it could be actually uh fired right it could be yeah. operated so yeah. it's still considered a receiver yeah, we call that a completed a complete yeah. lower receiver if it has the stock or handle yeah okay but you can still put it in your book as a receiver it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if it has the trigger mechanism in it. it doesn't matter if it's got a hammer a buffer spring tube any of that it's still a receiver until uh, that barrel is put on it it's not an operational firearm okay i use picks in pa thankfully already have local police involved me in denied transactions not a problem just a comment but yeah we've heard of lots of local states so this is moving fast in states where the state police um, are in charge of your background check program they're moving very fast and taking advantage of your denied transactions as identified by the fbi because that's where they, just so you guys know any point of contact state when you when you do your background checks they check state state and local records first that they have access to and then they push your background check through to next they actually do that as a part b to the background check program nix will identify whether or not that person was an actual convicted felon uh, specifically and those denials will get flagged 
uh, for attempting to purchase a firearm in your place of business. The law enforcement is running after these to get quick arrests. Uh, it's like a no warrant search and see an, an arrest process. Um, and and it's, there's no jury trial. It's a violation of the probation or parole. So law enforcement is going to run fast on these. Again, make sure your denial forms are completed through Box 35 completely and accurately. They will be, be subject to uh, evidentiary uh, support. So, and again, give them copies. Never give them the original when they come knocking at the door. And again, we don't have any other details as to who's going to knock on the door, who's privy to it, who's not. But if you got questions, uh, give us a call. We'll try to get more information on this as soon as possible. Hey, JB, just one more thing on that. If, if they want to take the original, we have had instances where they want to take the original, make sure you take a copy for your records and, and, and see, ATF is supposed to give you a receipt for that evidence. So make sure you're getting that receipt for evidence. That is required. Um, and worst case scenario, you can get something on agency letterhead that says they're taking the original copy of this and keep that information and log it. And if they're being, if they're refusing to do any of that, fine. Still make a copy of it for your records, document it, get down their information, get a business card from them. And make sure you're logging that information in your communications log. On this date, this time, special agent so-and-so with the ATF came in, took the original copy, made a photocopy, and keep that with the photocopy. So that way, when an investigator shows up to do an inspection, you have some record of that. Yep. Right. Matthew, thanks for the update on Delaware. They're, they got the assault weapons ban in place already. Um, guys, if, yeah, again, we're just trying to keep up with everything, but there's a lot of stuff flying around. Uh, <clears throat> reading through these is there, is there a process for a customer to check on why they are always a delay through nix or only for a denial if, if you have a customer that's always getting delayed or always getting denied and has to go through the process have uh, hand them the paperwork and have them go through the upin process chances are they have some attribute of their name or their demographics or whatever that is tying them to another individual that always gets denied or whatnot. So it's requiring human interaction with that record to determine whether or not that person is truly denied. Just have them go get a U-PIN. It makes their life so much easier. Yep. It is a typical one, JC. I think we get this once or twice a week now with all these inspections. In the past, when the ATF ordered us, they followed us everywhere that we went, including the office. In regards to refusing ATF access during audit, do I have to let them into my office? Absolutely. You have to let them in your office. You can't, re you can't deny entry. Um, right. If you deny entry, they're going to basically give you three opportunities. They're going to try their best to, to not you know, have to go through the process. If you deny entry, that is a revocable offense. They're going to get a subpoena and, and require you to let them in. So you cannot deny them access. If a customer has a valid ID, the data background check was run, but they come back three days later due to a waiting period or delay, uh, can I release the firearm to them? If a customer has a valid ID the day the background the, check... They have the initial background check is entered into... In this case, it would be ISP, Illinois State Police. You're not reevaluating their identity. Um, if it was good, then it's, you know, you're not asking for their ID again. You're not rerunning okay. a background check. So I would say yes. Okay. okay. Do we have to report straw purchase attempts to law enforcement? Yeah, there's no requirement for you to um, report straw purchase attempts. We do recommend it. Um, you'll never hear anything. You'll never know anything about it. But we do recommend um, we have a couple of FFLs that are real diligent about reporting straw purchase attempts. Uh, so the ATF and local law enforcement is very appreciative of it. Just to clarify re regarding returning, retaining my records up to August 24th, am I allowed to destroy records over 20 years old? Up until August 23rd, you can destroy any records that are over 20 years old plus one day. That's, all, that's my recommendation, just so you don't make a mistake. Okay, we sent oh, five yes, multiple and destroy them. Yeah. All right, next we sent five multiple forms on the day following the transfer and two that was sent on the third day. What are the odds we can get an FFL revocation based off of that? Repeat. So, the so, so they had five late uh, tra uh, multiple transfer forms. 
But here's what I recommend if you find that you um, are going to do a late submission of a 3310.4 or 3310.12. I believe it's block 14. 15. Details. 15? Is yeah. it 15? Yeah, 15 details. Yeah. Additional information. Uh, yeah, additional information. Um, here, here's what you put in that block. You say during an internal review, internal audit, we discovered that we mistakenly did not submit this, blah, 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 blah. Right. You just want to call yourself out. Hey, we're doing something above and beyond what is required. We found this. Um, chances are it will be pushed down from the National Tracing Center to your local field division uh, to let them know that, hey, they submitted a late um, 3310.4 or 12, um, or it will come up during the IOI's inspection process. Uh, they actually pull that report before they come in and do an inspection. So um, chances are somebody have notified of it. Now, if you had like a year's worth or something like that, it's definitely going to instigate an inspection. Um, be because you called yourself out on it, I, I can bring the defense that, hey, look, you know, they realized they did something wrong. They fixed it. Um, going forward, they're doing the right thing, et cetera. We've documented that they can't do it that way, et cetera. So um, it helps. Uh, don't not do it uh, because you're afraid you're going to get inspected or revoked. Go ahead and get it done. Work through us. We'll help you with that language. Uh, to help you uh, through that process um, and hopefully <laughs> avoid any type of uh, inspection possibly. But it does depend on how many you got. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm just <laughs> lots of good comments, guys. Before we, we're going to continue our questions. But we're going to do another event in August. Obviously, every month we haven't set a date for August yet. But if you have questions or issues you want us to present in our next event, live event, be, feel free to send them into JC at FFL Consultants or JB uh, info at FFL Consultants, any one of our emails, and we'll make sure we get those topics included for you uh, versus just what we think is hot and uh, necessary. Um, I'm trying to catch my place in questions here. All right, does 2021 R-05 apply to older frames? manufactured prior to serial numbers being required. Say that again. Does 2021 R-05F, the receiver um, frame yeah. new, new law, apply to all the frames and receivers manufactured prior to serial numbers being required? If, say, <laughs> you have any of these items in your possession today that are, you know, uh, part of a, a privately made firearm kit of sorts. Um, the, the bottom line is if they're still in your possession as an FFL, yes, you are going to be required to mark those prior to uh, commerce, prior to the sale. So if they're in your possession come August 24th, then you will be required to mark them. There is no grandfathering in of those items. Okay. If we identified an error on a 4473, can we get dinged if we call a customer back to make a correction? I'm assuming it's after a transfer. Oh, absolutely. Make a photocopy of the page the error exists on. Um, reach out to us so we can figure out whether how egregious the error is. Um, but make a photocopy of the error, the page the error is on and have them come back in. Make the correction on the, on the photocopy. Initial and date the correction. Uh, in some instances, we tell you to do like a memo for record. Uh, just outlining outlining the situation, uh, but it, it's all on a case by case basis. It just depends on the situation. Well, the question is, JC, will I will he get dinged on? And and the answer is, quite frankly, it depends on the type of violation it was. Yeah. It was yeah. absolutely. Uh, yep. Yeah. So if it, if you we have a term we've been using with people that call in, we say if you crash the car, you crash the car. It doesn't matter if you get it fixed at the repair shop. The ATF has not been allowing, um, has not been lenient in their discretion of whether or not you accepted a transfer on an outdated back uh, driver's license, for example, or um, accepted a CCW that was expired or from another state and you call the customer in to redo it. Every one of those types of scenarios requires handholding. You know, we can give you the best advice on how to try to correct it uh, versus just winging it based on the experiences we've had recently in arguing these violations through the the adverse action issues we've been dealing with 
we kind of figure out what, what's a push and what's not. And um, all I can say is uh, it depends on the violation. Would you agree, JC? Yeah. Here, here's the bottom line with it. Absolutely get it fixed. Because if and when you are inspected and that gets brought up, the IOI has some flexibility in looking at the scenario and making a determination of, okay, did this happen 24 hours or was it found six months after the fact, whatever the case may be. In addition to that, we talked about it earlier in the session. If and when it comes up and it is a violation on your report of violations, you have the ability at the, at the basically your closing conference to offer up an explanation. And you can say, yes, absolutely, understand this is a violation. However, just let it known, be known for the record that on this date, this time, we identified it internally and that we went through these steps to correct it. And that goes up to the director of industry operations and they're gonna look at it and say, yeah, it's a violation, but you know what? They caught it before we did and actually took measures and steps to correct it. So I'm okay with that. I think this is a, you know, a, an extenuating circumstance. Here's a real life, real life example. A couple of weeks ago, an FFL had an inspection and he was dinged. We call it, you know, I like the word dinged. He was cited for um, not submitting a 3310.4 multiple handgun form for a customer. And this was the scenario, believe it or not, even I learned from this. And on Monday, a customer bought a revolver. He took it home and shot it on Tuesday and it was defective and brought it back on Wednesday and hence was given a replacement revolver on a new 4473 with a new background check. Okay, so this customer was in within three days, ultimately left with one gun because he returned one gun, but the ATF cited him for not submitting a multiple handgun form, 3310.4, and believe it or not, there was no fighting. Uh, we tried to argue it and argue it and argue it, and um, went all the way to Washington, and the ruling was that there was no documented exception for returns of defective firearms. There's nothing in the, in the law that, sta that states that we did not have to do a 3310.4 in that scenario. And so to JC's re you know, explanation, at least we showed that we absolutely thought we were doing the right thing by, when we didn't do the right thing. And um, that, that, that FFL received a, a verbal warning, basically. Nothing formal, don't do it again. But um, it was one scenario where we actually argued and compromised um, by doing that. Um, here's another one, JC, this one's important. I had crossed out and initialed the correction on the 4473 while the customer was still there and I had him initial uh, the mistake. Am I in trouble for doing it? So the answer is yes. <laughs> If the, if the employee made a mistake, the employee fixes it. If the customer made a mistake, the customer fixes it. <clears throat> you cannot, you cannot um, cross that line <clears throat> and have any part in assisting that customer with their answers specifically to Section 21 questions. And you, it's a very fine line when you're coaching and counseling uh, the customer as to how to complete the form. You can refer them to the instructions uh, if they if it was a date of birth or they put the date of birth instead of expiration on the driver's licenses, that's more fact-based than, than um, uh, prohibiting question-based. You know, these types of questions we get every day and we help you through the correction process, who should do what, how to make it legit legitimate and um, compliant to the inspection when the ATF um, IOI shows up. And just so, so you know, that, that falls into the category of falsification. So you need to be really careful with that. Yeah. Yeah. So give us a ring. Um, do we have to report strip? Oh, we did that one. What exactly does responding to a traced request really mean? Say, I am, say I'm on vacation. I respond to the trace request stating. So with a date when I will return and respond with any information considered, considered a response. So um, we just had this with one of the FFLs that we support over on the East Coast. He was leaving the country for a month. Um, report it to your local field division. Say, look, I'm going to be out of town for a month. Report it to the National Tracing Center, the main phone number. I'm going to be out of town for a month. I won't have access to records. There's not a responsible person or anybody that will have access to it. Um, and you can email them too. Um, just, hey, want to let you know, XYZ. 
That way, at least you have some record of it showing that, hey, I understand that I'm supposed to respond in 24 hours, but I'm not going to be available. So just so you're aware, their understanding of that, people have lives. Yep. For compliance SOPs, what do you find the top five processes should be? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> well, well, um, we have. <laughs> we do a lot of this and have, have been doing a lot of it for years in fighting or presenting the correct corrective action plans for adverse action for the last 10 years. Um, but regarding SOPs, I mean, send us a note, send us an email directly to the JC or, or, or myself. We actually have a list of almost 36 or 37 SOPs. It all depends on what you do. If you're a range, a pawnbroker, uh, just a, a, a type one FFL retail, uh, but the top five, if there was top five, JC, and you, know, you know, jump in here, but I think it's completing a 4473, it's completing a background check, it's completing a trace, it's completing an A&D timely, that's four. Yeah. Uh, and, straw and purchase. Straw purchase is five. So there you go. There you go. Um, we do that so often, it's easy to um, to rattle off to you. Okay. All right. Um, what about Glock? P320 LPK, do we have to add the serial numbers for all the parts? Not exactly sure of that firearm. Uh, P320. Oh, I'll have to look that one up. Yeah. We can get back to you on that yeah. one. Yeah, send us that directly. What do you use to mark the firearm? Oh, that's a good question. What do you use to mark the firearm? Well, you can use any number of uh, tools to do so. Um, just know that there are specific requirements uh, that have to be met uh, as far as size and depth, uh, as well as location. So um, we have a lot of FFLs that have bought lasers, uh, laser uh, engravers. Uh, some FFLs are using the hand ones. Um, I don't necessarily recommend the hand one, uh, just because it, it, you know, doesn't look that good. Um, but you know, if you have to, you have to. Um, so I would, I, it, you know, look, the laser engravers are somewhat costly. So if you can find somebody else in your area to do it for you, that's what I would recommend uh, just from a cost saving standpoint. Um, but I mean, if you're going to go out and do it, take a look at the requirements and see what, what tools uh, that you can obtain uh, to do that engraving. All right. Yeah. And, and there are, yeah, it's not a, it's not an engraving pen. It's, it's, point, no. it's no. 0.003 inches deep by 0.016 inches. Um, I believe high. So just Google it. It's easy to figure out uh, ATF uh, marking requirements for firearms. Um, but but it, they have to be basically semi-permanent into the metal for longevity. Um, in Florida, we have background checks go into pending status for over 30 days before being changed to an approval. If a customer is approved on day 40 from the time of certification, should this still be released? <clears throat> And the answer would be no. Say that one again. Sorry. It, well, it, it, F, 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 uh, F, I, F, T, F, D, L, E is doesn't give a reply. And many states oh. are like oh, this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, here's the bottom line. Uh, Florida is one of those pending states. It's the same as Colorado. You have to get a response from them. If it takes over 30 days, start all over again. Yep. yep. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, yep. It doesn't matter if you get an approval at 40 days, 31 days start the process all over again. So here's an easy way to think about it. And uh, I was just up in Washington state has some real, has some other quirky laws, but here's the deal. If the ATF is in charge of your license, they issue your license. They are the governing body per se. Um, we could talk about California DOJ separately, but most all other states are governed by your, your FFL starts at the top with the federal government, the ATF. That's the license and the requirements you have to start with. Then you move to the state requirements. Okay. And then you move to anything local, you know, town, state, uh, city, municipal. So always start with the requirements of the ATF. That's what we try to train everyone to think, you know, think of it as a pyramid. Start at the top. If the ATF says you can or can't do it, move that, you know, and you're doing it correct according to their requirements, then move to your next level, which would be state requirements. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody gets wow. confused on this, this piece of it. Oh, especially with this type of background check. 
Uh, just going back to that Glock P320, I think they meant the SIG P320. Uh, no, the answer is no. I just took a look at it. Um, the lower is what's required, or the frame rather, is what's required to be serialized. Uh, none of the parts uh, are considered regulated. So it's, yeah. it's the frame of the handgun. Yep. So. And, JC, and if you're using this, if you have the SIG FCU, the fire control unit, yeah. Okay. If anybody knows what that is, um, it's the main component of it's a firing mechanism, right? Of the um, SIG that yep. inserts into the frame that is serialized. That, JC, am I correct to say that should be considered the frame of the firearm? Yep. 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 So um, that is what you. You, you, and you and you listed um, ATF hasn't published anything on this, but in all our checks with them, they say listed as an FCU or fire control unit. If that's what you're dealing with, uh, if you have more questions about that specifically, just give us a call. Uh, that's the type. The type would be FCU or fire control unit. Um, uh, why would I do a background check on someone who was previously denied? Uh, you don't have to. Uh, you can certainly ask them the question, especially if you're keeping good uh, record of all your denied transactions. You can say, hey, listen, you know, I know you got denied 30 days ago. Have you done anything to appeal it? Uh, and ask for evidence of that. You don't have to redo a background check at all for somebody that's been denied. You can you can deny as an FFL. Yeah. What should I do if I am notified of an impending visit by an inspector and I'm out of state or for, or for an extended period of time? We just had this happen in Texas. Worked very well. Um, the IOI was calling a part-time gun dealer, only open on weekends. He called ahead to figure out if he can get in on a Thursday or Friday to start an inspection. Long story short, uh, it wasn't uh, convenient uh, for personal reasons. The IOI is, was very um, collaborative. Just re you know, reschedule a date right there and then when he would be able to make it in at his next earliest convenience. So just be honest. We tell everybody, just be honest. Don't make stuff up. I mean, in this case, it was a, a medical um, issue, and he offered to present medical appointment documentation, so to speak, um, and the IOI was nice enough to say, no, that's not necessary. So every situation is going to be different, but give us a call if you have that question. We'll walk you through it, tell you how best to handle it. Um, try not to raise their suspicions, obviously. Don't try to make excuses that aren't warranted or just to buy some time to get ready for, for the inspection. They'll... They'll see right through that, and uh, that's not good. Okay. Um, if we destroy records older than 20 years and we have received a trace re request from that time period, do we simply tell the ATF that they were destroyed? Yep, you just need to do a couple things. Number one, do a memo for record. Nobody ever remembers, and just date, you know, put on there a date that you destroyed those records. On this date, we destroyed these records, da, 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 da. So that way you have something to refer back to, but just tell the ATF, yes. Prior to the new ruling, 2021 um, yeah. uh, 15F um, or 05F rather, uh, we destroyed all those records. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Just a couple, couple more questions here, JC. Do yeah. firearm manufacturers prior manufacture prior to 1968, you know, before serial numbers were required, do they need to be serialized? No. Okay, good. Yeah, and that's ex all the, you know, the other comment was classic collectible iron war, war yeah. guns. Um, you know, it's all. Um, newly manufactured basically ghost gun type firearms that the whole focus is on but old antiques collectors classics curios relics are excluded from the the new law okay. yeah. uh why, why not have the person that returned the defective firearm wait more than five days to get another one okay oh it's set up i guess that's the scenario i just mentioned um because the fought the ffl the gun dealer really didn't think nor did i think I hate to say that, but I got caught too, not knowing. Uh, we did not think that returning a defective firearm um, with a, a net transfer of one after three, you know, within five days w would be an issue. And, and we should have called. I, somebody should have called just to confer with the IOI or the ATF to figure out the right process for doing that. And um, unfortunately, we both goofed. So now we are sharing that wonderful information with all of you. All right. Uh, if there is a separate license from your regular FFL, not pawn, to sell used, is there a separate license from your regular FFL to sell used firearms? No, uh, yes and no. So there's nothing from a federal level. So you can be a one, a two, or a seven and sell used firearms. There may be some local ordinances 
that require you to get something called uh, possibly a secondhand dealer's license. Even though you're not a pawn shop, uh, you're still required to obtain that secondhand dealer license. Uh, different municipalities have different nomenclature for it, but uh, typically it's called something like a secondhand dealer's license or a, a used um, product dealer's license or something like that. So. Okay. So the answer is yes. Check with your local ordinance or your local code or ordinances and see if that's required. Places like Florida require it. There's a number of states that require it as well. Okay. You guys are great. Yeah, if you got a few more questions, drop them in here. We've still got some time. What do customers do with forced reset triggers? Uh, the forced re FRTs. Um, well, they were supposed to be surrendered or destroyed. <laughs> so um, that's, you know, it, like it's a regulated item. Uh, basically they're in possession of a, a machine gun. Uh, they can certainly attempt to submit a form one to register it. I doubt it's going to go through. Um, so they're, they're really supposed to surrender those or destroy them. Is a great one, JC. We, we didn't even hit on this during the conversation, but I print out Nick's re I'm sorry. Uh, we now separate IDs and receipts from our 4473s. Can the ATF ask for them during an inspection? Nope. Those are your business records. Those are not required by regulation to be obtained or, or maintained on file. Um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, that's for your purposes. In the event a situation dictates that you need to provide evidence of something that maybe got messed up on the 4473, you can supply that. There's nothing that requires you to keep that with the 4473. So keep those as your business records separate from your 4473s, those are not required. And uh, I'll, I'll bring this up because I was it, I had it last week during an inspection, but I um, had a an FFL who was attaching copies of everything to their 4473s. You know, part of our mock audit inspection is to streamline that process and correct it. And I I, I found um, a copy of a driver's license that was valid but his permanent residency card, his I-94, was expired. And they didn't catch it. So they transferred a firearm to, an, to a resident alien who was expired, and, um, but had a valid ID. So you know, I don't, I'm not gonna talk about that publicly here, but that, that's a good reason why you don't want to attach documentation to your 4473 that the ATF inspector will reverse audit against. Yep. They'll verify anything you have attached to attached to your form, your, your, your required paperwork, to see if they can find violations and errors. So um, definitely do not attach anything that's not required to be attached. Um, I, I print out the NICS results and attach them to the 4473. Is that a good practice, JC? Um, yeah, it's a good practice. I don't like adding anything. And JB probably has a contrary opinion on this. I don't like adding anything to the 4473 that isn't required by regulation. What I recommend with NICS results or, or the NICS response printouts is keep them in a separate file by date. And then every day you should be printing off your NICS uh, search uh, summary. Uh, that's just a report you can print off that shows all the NTN numbers that were issued for the day. That report's very vital and useful in counting your 4473s for the day. So you know it, that you you did this many background checks. I have this many corresponding 4473s with them. And I recommend keeping all that together by day uh, in a separate file. Now, I know JB says, go ahead and print it off and keep it with the 4473. I like keeping everything that isn't required separate. I want you to be able to get that for your business records as your evidence. Yeah. I don't want anybody to be able to challenge you on the information. Yeah. We call that a parallel file. Yep. It runs parallel to what you, your 4473 is in this file drawer and your, your documentation is over here in this file drawer. They're both labeled July 2020. You have a July 2022 file in both drawers for your reference. Yeah. Good. Their paperwork and your paperwork. So Jesse, I think that's it off. I think that's it. But folks, listen, uh, thank you for staying on so long. Uh, we will have a, a note out for uh, you guys when we uh, can schedule our, we have a crazy travel month in August. We will try to get something scheduled. Um, you can always, um, please like us on Facebook, like us on YouTube. Uh, please go out and see our, our training videos out there and visit our site. If nothing else, subscribe to us 
on our social sites so that you get uh, firsthand notification of when we push stuff out. We hope, hopefully we'll have some great um, short training aids for your staff, you and your staff, over the next 30 days. So get alerted to those by subscribing and ring that bell on uh, YouTube for us and uh, keep us going. Uh, if you really love what we do, please go out to Google, give us a little three-second review. Other than that, we're here for you. Um, there's our information. Call us direct. Uh, email us with your ideas for next month. And um, with that, JC, I think we're signing off. Yeah, thanks so much. For, and if we didn't get to anybody's question or someone's question, please just email us at info at FFLconsultants.com. We'll be glad to get that information back out to you. Um, we've already gone over 40 minutes, almost 45 minutes. So uh, it was a great turnout today. We really appreciate you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. Okay. Thanks, everyone.